Good morning, USNH. Welcome to this Sunday's online worship service. My name is Ethan Lowy. I'm a member here. I use he, him pronouns, and I have the privilege of being your worship leader for the day. As we enter into this sacred time, may you find peace and comfort. May the clamor of the outside world recede, that you can feel fully present and connected to the warmth of this community. May the spirit of life, the God of your understanding, push aside every distraction and suffuse your spirit with the joy of a new day. I pray all these things for all of us as I speak the words of our call to worship. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on your life's journey, whatever the color of your skin or your country of origin, whatever your gender and whatever the source of your faith, you are welcome here. And let us join in hymn number 349, We Gather Together. from now, August 18th, will be the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, in honor of the countless women who have fought bravely for their rights and demanded justice from an unjust world. We light this flame. And we speak the words of Reverend Olympia Brown, one of our Universalist ancestors and America's first ordained female minister. This is reading 569 in your gray hymnal. Stand by this faith, work for it, and sacrifice for it. There is nothing in all the world so important as to be loyal to this faith, which has placed before us the loftiest ideals, which has comforted us in sorrow, strengthened us for noble duty, and made the world beautiful. Do not demand immediate results, but rejoice that we are worthy to be entrusted with this great message that you are strong enough to work for a great true principle without counting the cost. Go on finding ever new applications of these truths and new enjoyments in their contemplation, always trusting in the one God which ever lives and loves. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Society of New Haven. My name is Jen Kapranov. I'm a member of the worship committee and I'll be your worship associate today. If you are joining us for the first time, we are so glad you chose to spend this time with us. We meet electronically for now, but we know that we will be together again in person someday. The membership team hosts a weekly Welcome Corner visitor chat. If you are visiting USNH and would like to learn more about us, or you want to join in and meet people, please join us via Zoom immediately after the service. You will find the link to Social Hour for newcomers in the Zoom chat section. All are welcome. Tech support needed. Are you interested in being part of our technology team, supporting our virtual services? We are looking for a few good folks to add to our team, 
training will be provided. If you are interested, please contact the Worship Committee at worship at usnh.org. Our worship leader today is Ethan Lowy. Ethan is a member of USNH, one of our pastoral care associates, and a candidate for Unitarian Universalist ministry. This fall, he will start his third year of study at Yale Divinity. Today's service asks, how can we find peace in the face of chaos? In 1845, Thoreau went to Walden Pond to escape the noise and chaos of modern life. In 2020, we face noise and chaos of a staggering new magnitude. How can we find courage and joy, steady our spirits, and focus on the people and pursuits that matter most to us? Now, as we enter this holy space of worship, may your spirit find focus and peace. Good morning, my name is Kathy Jackson and I'm a member of the pastoral care team. Let us turn our attention to the concerns of this community. I now invite you to join me in holding in our hearts the joy and sorrow of those around you, closing your eyes and going inward if you are comfortable doing so. Today, some woke with the sorrow so great, they asked for the help of this community to carry it. Others woke with a joy so great, it must be shared. Unfortunately, there are no joys to share this week. Lenora Howard passed away at the age of 94 on July 17th. She was a longtime member of USNH until she moved 16 years ago to an independent living situation in the Pittsburgh area to be closer to her daughter and family. While at Sherwood Oaks in Cranberry, Pennsylvania, she was active in the Unitarian Church there and continued to be a member of the Humanist Society. Sandra Salazar Hernandez shares her grief at the loss of her younger sister Katya in early August. Sandra and Jesse also ask for love and support for their older son, Bismarck, who was going through a very difficult time this summer. For all the joys and sorrows that haven't been spoken, but which remain in the silent sanctuaries of our hearts, we bear witness. Let us enter now into a time of guided meditation. I invite you to close your eyes, to sit, stand, or lie, however is most comfortable for you. If you're watching on Zoom, you may want to turn off your video. And let's just start by taking a few long, deep breaths. Try to count to eight on each inhale and exhale. This is a meditation for focus. There is so much noise in the world today. So many voices yelling at once that we cannot make out a word. Picture a hand turning down the volume until your own thoughts can come through unimpeded. There is so much stress in the world today, so much fear, anxiety, and email. Picture the ocean washing all of that away, wave by gentle wave. Feel your thoughts as they are cleared and refreshed. Next, I invite you to focus your thoughts on one person who you know to be courageous. A person whose spiritual strength shines like a beacon in your thoughts. Picture this person in your mind's eye.
Where are they? What are they doing? What expression are they wearing? How does the light hit them? Now, think of this person's courage. Why is this person courageous? What have they endured? What have they resisted? What have they given to you or to others? And what might this person say about the hard times we are going through today? Take a few more moments just to picture this person and cherish their presence in your thoughts. Know that despite all the chaos and all the noise, we can always focus our spirits on the gifts of connection and courage and love. Now let's just take a few more of those nice eight count breaths in silence. Now let us come back and be present together in worship. If today's service or any of our recent online offerings have struck a chord with you, I encourage you to navigate to our website, usnh.org, and click on the Donate button. By making as generous a donation as you can, you help sustain our vitally important social justice outreach programs, including Connect and UU The Vote. Please know these needs are ongoing, and so is the need for your support. The offering will now be gratefully received. Thank you. 
USNH, it is a pleasure to be with you this morning and a privilege to share some words from the pulpit. But this is not just any pulpit. See, I've been spending the summer in Philly with my parents at an apartment that they only moved into in January. It was just meant to be a short-term residence, so we don't really have any furniture here. As a result, I am preaching from on top of this modern art masterpiece. Yep, that is a stack of board games and an instant pot box. Let this so-called pulpit serve as a metaphor for life in quarantine. On some level, it is undeniably less than ideal. From a certain perspective, it might even seem like a pile of garbage. But by God, we are putting this garbage to work. We are fighting for solutions, cobbling together new ways of being. It's a long and messy process, but we are adapting. And we need every ounce of adaptation we can find right now. The past few months have worn on all of us. Week after week, our spirits have been tested by the COVID-19 experience, this labyrinthine swamp of anger, uncertainty, and sadness. The bad news just keeps coming, and it feels like we can't escape it. We're stuck inside, glued to our TVs and phones, unable to wake up from the nightmares in our newsfeed. When I say, we, I specifically mean me and my parents. See, ever since we've been quarantined, the Lowys have a fun game that we play first thing every morning. It's called, let's drive each other crazy with the news. The way you play is, you sit around reading Facebook and Twitter in a living room very much like this one. Find the most terrible stress-inducing headlines and read them out loud. Cultivate your outrage. Rub salt into your spiritual wounds. Dive face first into the chaos and the noise. Most mornings I haven't even put the coffee on before my dad tells me some distressing political news like uh, Congress's new plan to help families is to send everyone some Fritos and a scented candle. Or uh, GOP necromancers have resurrected Nixon and he's already winning Florida. After an hour or two of this game, we have completely shredded our mental and physical health, as well as our chances of doing anything useful with that day. It's a terrible game with no winners. You may have been playing it yourself without knowing it. It's hard to process this deluge of bad news much less thrive in the midst of it. We are all of us bombarded by news, much of it worrisome, flooded with vast oceans of data pouring in from more sources than our humble brains can handle. To focus on anything has become a countercultural move. Life in 2019 felt like listening to a radio playing five stations at once. Life in 2020 feels like 10 stations, and they're all in foreign languages. Paradoxically, it seems the more we see, the more we hear, the less we understand. So almost everyone I know, myself included, <laughs> feels overwhelmed. If I were going to run for president, and I still might if we can raise $900 million in this offertory, I would run on one issue, which is to legalize public screaming any time for any reason because people are pent up we can't process we can't focus we feel angry and scattered and lost so the big question i want to ask today is how do we deal with chaos what's our spiritual response how can we turn down the noise and focus on what matters the world has always held chaos on a grand scale. 
What's different in 2020 is how much we see and hear it at all times. And staring at that chaos can be remarkably addictive. According to psychology professor Graham Davy, our brains are wired to fixate on information that scares or unsettles us. A concept called negativity bias. And in the attention economy, where ratings and page views equal profits, outrage and bedlam can be a lucrative business. As an old TV, TV news saying goes, if it bleeds, it leads. It's like every day we watch a car crash, helpless to turn away. And while news addiction may be good for someone's bottom line, it's not good for us. More than half of Americans say that the news causes them stress, and many report chronic anxiety or fatigue as a result. Sites like Facebook and Twitter have come to function like casinos, windowless rooms with no clocks on the wall that will use every trick to keep us there, to keep us spending, consuming, and compliant. But fortunately, and here's where things start to get better in this doom and gloom sermon, there is timeless spiritual wisdom that can guide us through even unprecedented changes. In a time of clamor, the spiritual antidote is focus. Today, let's think on that discipline of focus through a very UU blend of three sources, the transcendentalist, the gospel, and Greek mythology. Let's look first at how focus can shut down the noise, as in Thoreau's famous jaunts to Walden Pond. As you may know, since you use love our transcendentalists, he sought to live deliberately, to transcend the emptiness and greed of the industrial age. His take on the excesses of technology and capital was incredibly prescient 166 years ago. He said, we do not ride upon the railroad, it rides upon us. So it goes with our shiny new devices, which evolve faster than our ability to live with them. Thoreau thought 19th century America was so hectic and stressful that he said, nope, I'm losing my mind, goodbye. Keep in mind, this was before the invention of the telephone, much less the internet, much less the smartphone, which is always connected to the internet. Compared to the tech overload of 2020, Walden is retrospectively hilarious. Oh, I'm sorry, Henry. You had to live near a few factories? That must have been so hard for you. And while the size of the disruption has grown in our lifetimes, this philosophy has lost no relevance. Thoreau exhorts us to live in each season as it passes. Breathe the air, drink the drink, taste the fruit, and resign yourself to the influence of the earth. Of course, we can't all relocate to the woods, even if we wanted to. The cabin life isn't for everyone, and Thoreau had his mom helping him with food and laundry the whole time. But maybe, by modern standards, pulling a Walden just means turning your phone off for a while. Checking the news one time a day instead of 39. Liber living deliberately does not mandate physical escape from our surroundings. Rather, it encourages us to slow down. Take care of our health, mental, physical, and spiritual. Celebrate the simple joy and natural beauty in our lives. And if focus can bring us peace amid chaos, it can also help us fight it back. For our second source, let's look at the gospel, Mark chapter 5, where Jesus heals a man possessed by demons. This man is an outcast from society, suffering and isolated. The scripture reads, night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. It's a haunting passage. Not only does Jesus speak to this man when no one else will, he goes far out of his way to be of service. Jesus crosses a lake to get to this guy, to one person, 
then heals him and crosses back over the lake with no thought of payment. Here we see Jesus as this paragon of active love, of direct action, willing to set aside all other concerns to do right by one person. And we can learn from that whether or not we believe that he was God. If he were here today, Jesus would be looking for that one place to help, one isolated person who could use a friend. He would not be glued to the news or arguing in comment sections. In my personal Christology, uh, Jesus would be highly judicious about his social media intake. But let's focus back on focus. In an abstract, unfocused way, the great crises in our world are completely unapproachable. But in a concrete, focused way, there is so much we can do to make a difference. The problem is when we flay ourselves into a state of paralyzed anxiety over things we can't possibly control to the extent that we don't do the many things we can control. That doesn't actually help anyone. Our mandate as Unitarian Universalists is simply to do our part for COVID safety, for eco-justice, for dismantling white supremacy. Our job is to do our part. What social justice can we fight for if we are pierced by 10,000 psychic spears? Shut out the noise and focus like Jesus did for the suffering man of Mark 5. Take one action, then another. Focus does not mean burying your head in the sand. It means centering your spirit on the people and the work that are closest to your heart. Now, full disclosure, uh, when I say we need to worry less and focus more, I'm being uh, fairly hypocritical. <laughs> um, focusing these days is hard. It's like swimming upstream, and I struggle with anxiety, news addiction, internet addiction, all these things. Yes, I'm, I'm just giving the sermon I need to hear. This focus is worth fighting for. Individually and collectively, we all have some steep mountains to climb. So rather than fret about reaching the peak, let's focus on climbing hard, climbing well. As the great Reverend Olympia Brown put it, do not demand immediate results, but rejoice that we are worthy to be entrusted with this great message, that you are strong enough to work for a great true principle without counting the cost. In the face of chaos, trust that you matter, that you are enough. Olympia Brown was a trailblazer and knew that great progress requires great persistence. August 18th, two days from now, will mark the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which won the vote for women. That victory and every victory since required vast fortitude and faith. And the struggle for women's rights is very much ongoing. It's a process of years. It calls on us to have focus and commitment. The same principles apply to any social justice movement. Black Lives Matter has made huge gains in the past few months, but it took years of dedication to plant the seeds that grew into today's movement and many more years of dedication are required. As BLM co-founder Alicia Garza said in an interview, our job right now is to make sure that we keep this momentum going. The unspoken concern in that quote is that people will lose focus, move on to something else, and the momentum will be lost. In the face of chaos, anxiety, and distraction, our challenge is to stay focused, stay tenacious, and keep working for change. To look at one last facet of focus, let's turn to Greek mythology, specifically the saddest story in the whole canon, but it's a great one, and it's been on my mind a lot lately. Talking about the tale of Orpheus and Eurydice, 
couple who make uh, Romeo and Juliet look downright fortunate. Orpheus was a legendary musician, sort of the Eddie Van Halen of his day. And one day his wife, the nymph Eurydice, is bitten by a viper and dies. Enterprising rock god that he is, Orpheus says, no way, I'm getting her back. So he walks into the underworld and gives a private concert to Hades to convince him to free his wife. Hades says, fine, on one condition. As you're walking back to the surface, you cannot look back. If you look back at any point, she stays forever. And Orpheus almost, almost makes it. But a few steps from the exit, his anxiety overwhelms him. He stops, looks back for Eurydice, and loses his beloved. Orpheus would then go on to be struck by lightning or torn apart by wild beasts, depending on what version of the story you prefer. There's a reason why Greek tragedy is shorthand for elaborately terrible events. It's a classic story with a hundred morals you could draw from it. But for me, the one that resonates right now goes something like this. When you're going through hell, keep going. Don't lose faith. Don't look back. Stay focused and trust that this suffering will pass. When you can't transcend the problem like Thoreau or fight it head on like Jesus, sometimes you just have to endure. Orpheus didn't need to look. He needed to walk. Let me wrap up by turning to my favorite poet. A year before his death, John Keats wrote, to bear all naked truths and to envisage circumstance all calm. That is the top of sovereignty. And perhaps the poor man was right. There was much to be said for staring into the abyss. Awareness is a virtue. And of course, we need to know what's going on in the world to be good citizens. But Keats also wrote of the virtue of negative capability, our power to act amid uncertainties, which we will always have, because that comes with being human. In the months ahead of us, we will meet uncertainty, anxiety, and an endless supply of alarming headlines. May we stay grounded when we do, and have the faith to keep walking up towards daylight. Unitarian Reverend Theodore Parker later rephrased by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But maybe the moral arc of the universe is not an arc, because arcs are smooth. Maybe the moral progress of the universe, such as we can understand it, is a lurching, jagged path that moves sideways and backwards and in spirals. May we have the courage and the focus to walk that path, first with one step, then another. Friends, I pray that we will cultivate our ability to focus, that we might shut out the noise and find a stillness in our souls, a place for peace and joy and righteous works. Amen. Ashe. May it be so.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Hear now the benediction. As we go forth today, know simply that we are not helpless. And no matter how troubling tomorrow's news may be, there is joyful purpose to be found. May we all grow in focus and persistence, and may the people and pursuits that fill you with divine love take up the lion's share of your attention. Now go in peace, knowing that we are one and we are loved. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.